Welcome to the Visiting Artist Lecture Series for Spring 2022. The next lecture in this series is on April 19th with Leticia Baggio. I want to encourage you to visit the Art and Art History website for more information about this historic program and all upcoming presentations. This presentation will include the artist talk followed by a short Q&A moderated by me. Once the presentation is finished, please type your question in the chat box to the right of the video in YouTube. My name is Anna Moriarty. I'm a graduate student in the Interdisciplinary Media Arts Practices Program. It is an honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Sam Van Aken. Sam Van Aken is a contemporary artist who works beyond traditional modes of art making, crossing artistic genres and disciplines to develop new perspectives on themes of communication, botany, agriculture, climatology, and the ever-increasing impact of technology. Uh, Van Aken's works in the natural and public realm are seen as metaphors that serve as the basis of narrative, sites of placemaking, collective learning, and in some cases have even been the basis of scientific research. Born in Reading, Pennsylvania, Sam Van Aken received his undergraduate education in art and communication theory. Immediately following his studies, he lived in Poland and worked with dissident artists under the former communist regime through the auspices of the Andy Warhol Foundation and the United States Information Agency. Van Aken received his MFA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and since this time, his work has been exhibited and placed nationally and internationally. He has received numerous honors, including a Joan Mitchell Foundation Award, Association of International Curators of Art Award, and a Creative Capital Grant. Most recently, his work has been presented as part of Nature Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial with the Cube Design Museum in the Netherlands. Sam Van Aken lives and works in Syracuse, New York, where he is currently an associate professor in the School of Art at Syracuse University. Please join me and give a warm welcome to Sam Van Aken. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to start by, uh, you know, thank you, Anna, for the introduction and thank you everyone at the CU Art Department uh, for welcoming me uh, here this week. Uh, I, as much as I've enjoyed my time here, I think this is my last trip to Boulder as it's just absolutely uh, too hard to leave in the end. Um, so it's, yeah, it's rather heartbreaking. So um, for uh, this talk, I thought as opposed to doing a highlight reel of, of sort of, um, you know, what I think are best works. Uh, typically when I talk at, at schools, I, I, you know, I like to talk about sort of like my progress as an artist and hope that it can benefit, um, you know, either the undergrads or the graduate students. And I think just about everything I've learned in the art world, I've, or at least half of what I've learned, I've, I've learned by mistake. So if my mistakes can be helpful to anyone, um, yeah, more than happy to share. So I, uh, so just, so I grew up um, on a dairy farm in Pennsylvania, and um, as you know, as much as uh, we, it was a modern farm, um, you know, we used modern growing practices. It was really sort of like the 19th century. Um, we grew our own food, uh, we made our own clothes, and um, I really credit growing up on a farm with sort of instilling this ethos in me that. Um, you know, if you don't have what you need or you desire, you make it, you know, you use what it is around you and make it. And so, you know, growing up on a farm, being an artist was not an option. Um, so when I went to college, um, I, I wasn't even majoring in art. I mean, I had always been drawing, but um, never knew how I could, you know, quite make a career or a living or, you know, even feed myself doing it. But I, I continued to take drawing classes and printmaking courses. And um, so my college education was um, unorthodox. So this was my college ceramics professor. Uh, his name is Dick Wookage. Uh, you know, we had known by everyone as Wookage, um, who would do these <laughs> extraordinary things that you couldn't get away with in an academic setting now. Uh, so this photo is from uh, when he organized a spring break trip for students um, who unknowingly went to Bosnia during the war to drive ambulances. Um, but with him, I, I owe him an incredible debt because through his teaching, I learned about dissident artists. And as I came to the end of graduate school, he helped uh, 
you know, set me up to travel to Poland to live and work with dissident artists. And so this is the work of Yaroslav Kozlowski, one of the artists that I worked with uh, while in Poland. Um, so dissident artists were artists that uh, could were would not or could not legally make artwork um, under the communist regime. So not having access to art materials or art supplies, they made art from what was around them. And they would have these one night exhibitions in living rooms and uh, you know abandoned factories, and they would risk going to jail, um, you know, just by the mere fact that they were making art. And it it elevated art for me, right? It, it's not you know it's definitely not the holiday or weekend practice, and it's not only an aesthetic issue. Um, and so you know, coming back and and returning from Poland. Um, I started to work with the, the materials that I had around me. And, you know, eventually that evolved into working with media. Um, I became, uh, you know, I, I started to look at mass media, right? So this is just slightly pre-internet where, where we all had this sort of common language that was built through uh, limited streams uh, of media. So um, this piece is entitled World's Most Amazing Video. Um, so in this 16 inch heating vent is a nine inch uh, surveillance monitor. And in order to see the, the video screen, you have, well, let me tell you about the video. The video is of a, um, is, it was on one of these TV shows, these reality TV shows called World's Most Amazing Video, which is a typical sort of like car crash, motorboat crash thing. And then at the end, uh, there was an actor, Stacy Keach, who I, you know, he played like a bad detective in the seventies. Um, he comes on and they offer a $10,000 reward for anyone who knows the identity of the person in this video clip. And so it cuts to the clip and there's a zookeeper sweeping an elephant's pen. And the zookeeper slips with the broom, hits the elephant in the back of the knee, and the zookeeper's head goes into the elephant's backside. And I, you know, it cuts back and they, you know, they're like a $10,000 reward. And it, it was just sort of like, how the hell could they actually air that and um, let alone offer a reward for it? And I'm thinking of all the embarrassing things that I do on a daily basis that I wouldn't want caught on video. And, and I was thinking of like, how can I take this, this clip and turn it into kind of like an empathy machine? So I thought by placing the monitor inside the vent, and you have to put your head inside of it to watch that it would develop empathy. Um, and um, it kind of worked, but a lot of people would watch the video and tell their friends to do it and kind of go from there. But um, yeah, it was, this is sort of representative of some of the first works I was, I was making using video. And, you know, after that original piece, I think I, I sort of got pretty introspective and started to, um, to deal with a lot of the things, you know, of life experience. And so, this piece is entitled The Multiple Deaths of Willem Dafoe. And um, I had just actually seen someone pass away. Um, and it's an image that I, I can recall to this very day. Um, but I was thinking about how we're, we process images of death through media on a constant basis, how we can watch a scene over and over, yet we're willing to suspend disbelief to see that character move into their next role. And so I decided to make a funeral setting for the actor uh, Willem Dafoe, who at the time had, uh, you know, had died, had had 13, uh, you know, movie deaths. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of the setting. Uh, the next piece, uh, you know, and, and sort of, I moved from video into audio work for a little bit. Um, and in trying to make these more experiential pieces, I think the the funeral setting was a way to uh, you know kind of broaden my practice, and I'm starting to look at ways of of getting more um, more participation with the work. So this piece stacks, I think, 700, 750 home stereo speakers into an eight foot tall by fifty foot long wall, and uh, the wall is um, here's a side view of it. 
So the wall is all sort of scaffolded and supported from behind and all of the, the stereo speakers are wired to a computer. And on that computer is an algorithm that randomly selects from a database of 600 clips uh, taken from you know, film, television, news of people saying the phrase, oh my God. And with it, I was thinking how that single phrase can, can cover such a broad band of emotions so it's everything from ecstasy to terror. And so the piece develops over, over six minutes. And uh, what happens is at first, there's a random clip that you might hear from you know, the top left of the wall, then one from the bottom right. And through that six minute uh, process, eventually it builds up to a crescendo of, the, of screaming, oh my God, and then cuts out and there's a huge reverberation within the room. So at, at the same time as I'm developing a lot of these, these early media pieces, the other thing I keep coming back to is this idea of grafting. My great grandfather uh, made a living grafting fruit trees and I had never met him, but um, you know, everyone that, that spoke about him talked about him as if he, he had some mystical capability uh, because he knew how to graft. And with that, and then with also recognizing grafting as this metaphor that speaks so much about, you know, the hybridity of, of kind of our contemporary existence, um, I started to work with grafting and um, started to take these pieces of plastic fruit I had left over from an installation and sticking them together in really weird combinations, ultimately coming to discover that you cannot combine fruit without making it look very lewd. Um, so I, I you know, anything worth doing, you, you do 500 times. So I did about 500 of these, um, had them in an exhibition. And one of the things that the, the thoughts that evolved out of that was this idea of, can I make this real? And so that ultimately led to creating a, uh, an entire, you know, I created these four gardens and each of the gardens grows from one rootstock, right? So there's one stem that comes out and all of these vegetables are, are growing up and, and from that one single root system. And uh, the title of this, I mean, it was pretty heavy handed, but um, it, the idea of this was Eden. Um, it was, I had shown it in, um, in Bar Harbor, Maine, which uh, was originally known as Eden. And I was thinking of this way of, um, you know, just how we're retooling and tinkering with nature at, at a pretty significant level. So um, yeah, here's some of the install shots from that. So this ultimately led me to, uh, you know, <laughs> I had collected those, I think I had, at one point I had collected over a thousand home stereo speakers and they're all in my studio. Um, and I was in my early thirties and I'm like, I'm looking at all these home stereo speakers and I'm going, oh my God, I've become the cliche of an artist, like, you know, pursuing this sort of like vision. Um, and, um, you know, it, and it, you know, nobody tells you that in the art world that like success doesn't come till closer till 40. So, you know, I, I was thinking, God, I'm like, what am I doing with all of this? And, um, I began to think in that pursuit of these visions that I was a lot like Roy Neary, uh, the title character from the, uh, from the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So if you haven't seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, it's about this uh, Indiana utility worker who's out fixing power lines, comes into contact with aliens, at which point he starts having visions of Devil's Tower in Wyoming. He starts sculpting them in shaving cream and his mashed potatoes, builds this massive tower in his living room, finally recognizes what it is, travels to Wyoming to meet the aliens, and he's taken away by the aliens. So I, I thought, you know, it, it's one of the first movies that I had I had seen, right? It came out when I was like five or something, and my dad was a huge sci-fi freak. So I, I thought, do we just recreate the the narratives we see as when we're young? And just to sort of test out the idea, I decided to take on the role of Roy, Roy Neary, and I purchased a three hundred dollar station wagon. Drove to Muncie, Indiana. I convinced this homeowner in Indiana to let me throw dirt in their window. Um, I then followed uh, Neary's pilgrimage to, to Wyoming, um, all in this car. And um, 
I climb the mountain, I climb Devil's Tower, I get to the other side, and like, I don't know what I was thinking, but I, there was, I didn't think of what the conclusion might be. I was like, the aliens didn't take me away. And I was like, this, I, what am I doing? This is like the worst project I've ever done. So I start driving back. And as I'm driving back across Route 80, I, I pass into to Iowa and I see these windmills and it, it dawns on me this idea that the whole project is like Don Quixote, right? Of how we try to mimic these narratives, yet we, we ultimately fail, right? Everything becomes an absurd imitation of it. And, and for a while, what I was doing is um, every time I would have a gallery show, I would create a stage set and um, I would reenact one of the videos uh, or one of the clips from the film. So this is the famous living room scene where he sculpts this enormous mountain. And, uh, you know, so the I had video cameras that were on the front and they would live sync to videos on the back. Um, and here's where the scenes were, you know, sort of match up. But ultimately are never the same. Um, ultimately, it, it um, the whole piece comes together with uh, a dual screen video projection where, um, you know, I have the clips of Neri alongside of my, my reenactment clips. And um, yeah, that's the train set for any of you fans of Close Encounters. Um, and so like looking into narratives and, and sort of, you know, more questioning of reality, I, I became interested in the idea of the hoax. Um, and, and what I was really interested in is how something that is said or something that is told uh, can completely transform reality. Like it can completely transform how we look at, how we perceive, and even just sort of the causality within the space. Everything takes on a different life, becomes active in a different way. And I had um, I'd always uh, just been fascinated by the 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast. And um, I was driving through New Jersey and came across the town Grover's Mills. And I always thought it was a fictitious town. Um, so in the 1938 broadcast, it was done by Orson Welles. Aliens were so, you know, purported to have landed in the town of Grover's Mills. And they're gradually taking over the East Coast. And at the time when radio was the dominant form of media, uh, you know, people panicked. There are a lot of people that packed up their cars, their kids, and they drove away from the East Coast thinking this really was an alien invasion. And um, so upon entering Grover's Mills, I found this was uh, Mr. Grover's house. And in the back of Mr. Grover's house, uh, was this thing on the left, um, which was a, a windmill, which had been converted into a standpipe. And then on the night of the War of the Worlds broadcast, the citizens of Grover's Mills went out hunting for the alien ships as they were just, they were described in the radio hoax and they shot holes through this tower. Right. And, uh, so I had, um, asked the, you know, I, going up and asked permission to take photographs of it. And the owner wanted to get rid of it. And we tried to, to ultimately take it down, but um, it was so rusty, I had to recreate it. So I sort of continued the transformation of this object, right? So moving it from the windmill to the standpipe to the alien ship, and I started using it as a broadcast antenna. And I was staging my own hoaxes. Um, so I set up a radio studio in the gallery right next to the tower and um, would use all these sound effects props uh, to stage hoaxes about uh, the climate and um, or just sort of about weather events. And um, the one thing that you find is that um, I had actually the other thing that's really important is in the sort of the back corner of the image on the left is an FM broadcasting unit that had a reach of about 20 miles. And so what I was using, I was going on to FM frequencies and, um, you know, playing these clips. And it's interesting. There's a there's a thing called the FCC that does not look finally upon that. And this exhibition was all sort of over within a day. Um, but I kept coming back to this idea of the tower over and over and like it, it, it's certain transformations and came back to the idea of a hoax and. I found that hoax comes from hocus pocus and hocus pocus in turn comes from a line in the Catholic Eucharist, hoc est enum corpus meum. 
And it's the point in which the priest says, this is my body over the bread and transforms it literally for Catholics into the body of Christ. And it's a process known as transubstantiation. And I began to, to start to think of like, how could I make something that was, was like that tower or, or was like that piece of bread? And so that ultimately with the, the work I was doing with grafting, and with this idea of transubstantiation, uh, the idea of the tree of 40 fruit evolved. And so the tree of 40 fruit, it's a single tree that grows 40 different varieties of stone fruit, uh, including peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, almonds, um, all on one tree. And so it, it's meant to be a normal looking tree until it blossoms in spring. And you get these different tones of pink and white and crimson. And then in summer, it has a multitude of fruit that ripen from about late June, like into October. And so the, the trees are created through the process of grafting. Um, so grafting is a pretty simple process. It's been around for, um, you know, some of the first accounts they say are 4,000 years old. Uh, the one thing to note is that fruit trees, uh, since they are hetero heterozygous or genetically unstable, they produce seeds that differ from the parent. So when we find a fruit tree that we like, we have to graft it in order to reproduce it. Um, the majority of fruit trees uh, that are grown right now are all grafted trees. And so I use sort of variations on this project to, to create the tree of 40 fruit. So one of the things that um, that became abundantly clear as soon as I started is that I was having difficulty finding 40 different varieties of fruit, right? Um, I And this is in New York, which 100 years ago was the second leading uh, producer of plums, the third leading producer of peaches, one of the leading producers of cherries. And it's as if that whole sort of history had disappeared. And so I ultimately, uh, you know, found uh, varieties at research universities, at old farms, and I, I would collect them and bring them back to here. I was only working out of a probably like a 1,500 to 2,000 square foot space, but I had 300 to 400 varieties uh, contained within it. So to create the tree of 40 fruit, what I'll do is I start that original graft onto a new root system, let it grow for three to five years and do what they call heading off the tree so that it develops uh, lateral or scaffolding branches. And at that point, I can begin to start to graft more and more varieties onto them. And so this is what they look like at planting. And then this is what they look like about four, four or five years later um, as they start to reach full growth. And here's some details of them um, while they blossom. So each of the, the trees has a map. And one of the things that I, I sort of discovered early on is that each of the varieties has a slightly different blossom time, a slightly different form, and a slightly different color. And that by creating a timeline of when they blossom in relationship to each other, I could essentially design and then sculpt how the tree blossoms. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then I'd map it out, uh, you know, using these lines and here's some of the trees and fruit. So, yeah, and these are different locations, um, for the tree of fruit, 40 fruit. And what I'll do with these is that, um, you know, as I'll, I'll be invited to, to create these trees, um, it was interesting. At first, this project was all supported by the art world. Um, it was art collectors who actually helped support the project so that I could continue doing it. And then eventually it got to the point where um, it's a lot of work to create these trees. So it's, you know, I grew them for three to four years in the nursery. And then once they're planted, I go back and visit them for three to five years to continue to graft on them until they have 40 varieties. Um, and, and they're established. And so after, you know, several, several years, what I started to do is only focus on, on public sites. And so these are the various sites that, that the trees are located. Also, the other thing I should mention is that I make each tree site specific. So I'll research all of the varieties that are grown in a specific region. 
and I'll I'll work with uh, various universities, local farmers, uh, the USDA, and to source find all the varieties and then graph them onto the tree. And then um, so this is ultimately it led to um, to start doing larger planting of the trees. So these are eight trees that are uh, planted at the Everson Museum in in Syracuse, New York. So I, you know, I, I done the tree of 40 fruit for about four years and I, I sort of thought it was over. Um, I, you know, in that four year period, one of the things that I, I realized was how much the climate was changing. Um, in 2012, the USDA uh, changed the grow zones for the United States. Um, what that means is that the climate shifted and that you could now grow varieties from warmer climates in your area. And I, I thought that was just like a really pivotal moment for us. And I didn't think it got enough attention. So I really became fascinated with the weather. And um, in particular, I became fascinated with, uh, with attempts to change the weather. Everything from sort of uh, ritual practices to change the weather to kind of those charlatan practices that happened in the 1930s with the Dust Bowl to uh, ways that we're changing the weather now. And so that led me to create a piece called The Hole in the Sky. And uh, so these images started to appear on the, on the internet um, probably like 15 years ago. And of course, everybody blames them on uh, aliens and Russians, but I was like, probably not. And I started to look into where they were occurring and they, they were in proximity to airports. And so did a little work on it and found out that um, they were actually being created as uh, jets were passing through a particular cloud type. And what would happen is that cloud type was composed of super cooled water droplets that as the plane uh, passed through, it would force them to slam together and create this like beautiful thing called the fall streak in the center, which I was like, that is the perfect uh, sculpture. <laughs> Um, so I, I was like, okay, how do I, you know, go about making these? So research the, the type of clouds exactly and find out that they're alto cumulus clouds, um, often called a macro sky. Um, I became a junior meteorologist, uh, trying to figure out when these, uh, cloud, uh, formations would occur and at the right altitude, I would talk to a pilot. Um, so I had a pilot in a town near me. I would rush over, we would go fly around um, Syracuse, New York, where I'm based, and uh, we put holes in clouds. And it was kind of interesting because it was like, I think that might have been the artwork for like one or two people that might be actually looking up at the sky at that time. Um, and it, it was kind of interesting. I, you know, when I started the, the hoax work, I thought, what if I could create an artwork that was sort of a rumor? right, that had no material form that was, and, and could transform, um, you know, reality. And uh, the interesting thing is I think I achieved it with this piece. So once I tell people about this piece, then I don't ever have to make it again. Um, people just start sending me, you know, pictures of holes and clouds. And they're like, hey, did you do this? Um, so this is like in up, the upper part of Michigan. Um, this is on the highway going to New York City. Uh, and a friend was in Ireland. Um, so it's this piece that, uh, it's, it's sort of the easiest piece to make for me. Um, so yeah, I, I had shifted over to working, um, with the weather and then, um, this, yeah, this happened. So the, somehow the tree of 40 fruit got picked up online. And so things like this started to happen. This was a marriage counselor from Indiana they just posted this on their website. Um, and then it became a meme. Um, so uh, that was really uncomfortable. And then what continues today is like every once in a while, you'll post like images of the tree of 40 fruit on his, uh, you know, yeah, on social media. Um, so it, it definitely, the project got way out of, out of hand, um, you know, and sort of, extended way beyond anything that I, I had actually thought. So I, um, one of the things you wouldn't think that a meme would lead to this, but it led to me being contacted by this place. Uh, DARPA is the defense, um, what is it? Defense, uh, 
I don't know, something agency, uh, part of the Department of Defense. And they had um, contacted me after the Tree of 40 Fruit went through its sort of like verse, first viral thing. And they were like, hey, we want you to come to Washington to talk about creativity for scientists. So I go there and then they start asking me questions about food security. And it turns out that food security is a major concern um, for the country. That um, what's happened is we've narrowed the number of food varieties down to, uh, you know, possibly growing maybe eight to 10 varieties of each type of food or, or fruit or vegetable. And so what happens is if a disease affects them, then it can cause, uh, you know, it can greatly impact our, our food sources. And um, you want to look at a horror story, look at the Cavendish banana. Um, there's a fungus affecting it. So the banana, as we know it, might uh, disappear. So um, I, I went back and I started to look at all of the different varieties that I collected through the Tree of 40 Fruit. So I was growing um, beach plums. Beach plums uh, used to grow wild. Uh, it's a native uh, fruit tree that grew on the eastern shores of the United States all the way from Virginia to Maine and was a, a staple crop uh, for Native Americans. Other varieties I was growing was uh, the blood peach. Uh, this is another early variety. Um, it was introduced by the Spanish, cultivated by Native Americans for almost 200 years uh, before it was discovered in orchards in New York and Pennsylvania. And then some of the first in cherries that were introduced um, by uh, colonists, by the Dutch colonists who, uh, you know, traveled the Hudson River. And so at that point, I, I was also told that I had some of the, you know, some of the last remaining or existing uh, varieties. And it, uh, you know, so to give you an idea of the diversity of, of the, the fruit, like these are plums collected from one tree of 40 fruit in one week in August. And um, all of that diversity, uh, as all that diversity diminishes, I had some of the last varieties and it caused me incredible anxiety. So I was like, what can I do to preserve them? And so I started with what I knew how, which was through artwork. So that's taking uh, the trunks of heirloom orchards as they're being torn out and uh, preserving them as these sort of like totems. Also creating my own herbarium. Uh, so I, I press uh, branches and leaves from particular varieties uh, to create their herbarium. And then those ultimately, each variety became a voucher specimen, which it's like a legit uh, scientific specimen that were, you know, they're often made for scientific study, but then they're often used by uh, botanical illustrators to, to draw certain varieties. And ultimately that led to my own herbarium. So, uh, you know, this, the collection is probably about 250. And this was a show at the Broad Museum at Michigan State. And then I'm keeping this one on the road. So now um, here's some samples um, of it. And uh, it, this is also included in an exhibition at Arizona State University that just opened this past Friday called New Earthworks. So ultimately that led to creating botanical drawings. A lot of these varieties, there were never any illustrations made of them. And so I'm creating the first botanicals of these varieties and then creating uh, these, uh, you know, descriptions of each of the each of the varieties compiled from dozens and dozens of books. And then recently that's, uh, you know, doing the botanical drawings, I've started, um, I built a, a etching uh, studio in my basement where I create these uh, etchings that layer all of the botanicals that may have been done to a particular point with each variety, almost like a palimpsest or, or a complete history etched onto one plate. So then um, the other thing that I started to do is actually started to do workshops um, and uh, show people how to start new trees. So that's taking branches from a tree in the middle of winter and grafting them onto a new root structure. And the weird thing it led me to was the World Economic <laughs> Forum of all places where I sat and showed um, Will I Am how to graft trees uh, because he was really interested in how he could do it with citrus trees at home. And then, um, 
Peter Gabriel was there. And I was like, and the amazing thing about meeting him was that he grew up on a dairy farm in England and um, he was interested in grafting his olive trees in Sardinia. And I was like, of course you own an island on Sardinia. Um, but what ultimately uh, I realized through doing all of this work is that, you know, for these things to be truly preserved, that I need to get them out to people, that I need to, uh, you know, that people need to taste them. They need to learn the processes of growing and know their history. Um, I began to look at these trees or these fruit, not just as these agricultural products, but they were really cultural products, right? If it if it requires us to graft a tree every 20 years onto a new root system, they're dependent on us as much as they're dependent on, on the environment for their growth. And each of those varieties also has an origin story. It has a particular provenance where it passes from one hand to the other. And for some of the, those varieties I've, I've had for, you know, some of those varieties have been growing for thousands and thousands of years. So I was like, okay, I am going to place these in the densest place I know where, which was New York City. So I researched the history of New York and fruit in New York and found out that you could probably argue that New York City is the home of fruit growing in the country. Uh, it's, it's pretty well documented that the Lene Lenape, the first peoples of New York, were uh, cultivating beach plums, uh, crab apples. They were even growing peaches um, at the time of uh, Verrazano uh, entering New York Harbor. Um, as it evolves, as colonialism continues, uh, continues uh, those blue marks you see on the map are areas where farms were established. So most of New York at, at one point or the other was a farm. And then the areas in orange are where specific varieties originated. And grafting itself was introduced in New York when uh, French Huguenots arrived in Queens who had these highly refined agricultural skills. And they, uh, they started to introduce grafted trees. At the time, uh, nobody was really grafting fruit trees. They were growing peaches to feed to hogs and they were growing apples for cider because uh, potable water was not readily available. So it, I shopped the, the project around for this idea of creating this public orchard. Uh, I shopped it around for years. I, I think it was like three or four years I, I shopped it around. And uh, you know, funny, nobody would give me an acre and a half of land in New York City until uh, I uh, proposed the project to Governor's Island uh, Governor's Island is a three minute ferry ride off the southern tip of Manhattan. And uh, yeah, fortunately, they wanted to go ahead with the project. And so in 2018, we started a nursery of trees. So I started the first 200 uh, individual varieties of fruit trees. Uh, we then transferred them to a nursery, um, which I, I have to say it's probably the best fruit tree nursery in terms of view, uh, where you can see the whole uh, sort of skyline of Manhattan over the trees. And these are the trees as they grew through the pandemic. Um, so these are plum varieties, um, and these are apricot and peach varieties uh, that were growing there. So while I'm doing this, I also develop a, a partnership with Green Thumb, part of New York City Parks, and we uh, start to do workshops. At first they were in-person workshops and then through the uh, the pandemic, we I was doing virtual shot workshops on how to graft and grow fruit trees. Um, other things were what to do with fruit. So, uh, you know, when to pick fruit, how to process it for drying or canning. And then that even grew into like the most horrifying thing in the world, which is doing your own cooking show. Um, so I was actually recreating, you know, centuries old dishes that I had found while doing research on particular fruit varieties. So um, we were held up by the uh, by the pandemic, but ultimately uh, we we started uh, working on the site. Um, and uh, so this is the, the site map at Governor's Island. Uh, we obviously since this is new york city land we had to dig out these tree pits and um 
we planted the orchard at the end of October uh, this past fall. You can see from here. And then uh, we planted all the trees out. And so each of these trees, there's 102 trees total. Uh, they will, are grafted with three to four different varieties of fruit on each one so that we're gonna be able to grow at least 300 different varieties of fruit. And these are all varieties that are indigenous to, that originated within or were historically grown in New York City. And um, they tell the story. Uh, they tell the story of uh, agriculture before uh, Europeans arrived in New York. They tell the story of waves of migration that came to New York. And in many ways, I, I think about them as New York, as it currently exists, as this amalgamation of all of these different cultures and continents. So this is another view of the orchard. And I have to admit, the views are just unbelievable. You can see the Statue of Liberty here um, in the background. And then this is probably my favorite view because it looks down the rows at Ellis Island. And it's just sort of this reminder of, of people bringing fruit with them, whether they are the Lenny and Lenape, whether they are the first Dutch settlers, or even today where people bring trees with them as a connection to their home. Uh, so the other major part of the project is that in addition to the 100 trees that are planted in the orchard, there's another 100 trees that are going out to community gardens throughout New York City. So this is sort of like a public art project that overtakes five boroughs in New York. Um, so we did our first fruit tree distribution to, to those gardens. And what I'm trying to do is place the varieties back into the neighborhood where they originated um, or where they were historically grown. And um, I, so we, uh, you know, packed up trees, I guess this is mid-March. So what is that? Like about a month ago, um, loaded them onto a dump truck and began distributing trees. And I think this is probably the best thing that I have ever done because every time, every place that I've sent them out to, like everybody has the greatest smile. <laughs> And in a lot of these places, what we're, we're doing is reintroducing fruit trees that back into these food deserts. So uh, the project is, cultivate, or <laughs> is uh, culminating in um, a series of books. So I'm, I'm working on a, a book about the project, another field guide like you see here that has all the fruit varieties in it and the, uh, and the descriptions. And then also a cooking book, which I don't know how I feel about yet, but um, yeah, uh, that one's as yet to be determined. Um, and so just to give you an idea of what my spring looks like this past week, um, I was working on what I'm calling the Mission Peach. In January, I traveled to Arizona and um, started to trace the history of the peach. The peach was first introduced into Arizona by, uh, by priests, by Catholic priests through the mission system. Uh, as the mission system collapsed, they were then cultivated uh, by all of the, uh, you know, the first peoples of Arizona. Um, the Navajo in particular uh, had extensive orchards, which were ultimately cut down as a way to dispossess them of their land. And then the peach starts to come back as farmers start to inhabit uh, inhabit Arizona. So uh, I went out and I tracked down some of the first, uh, some of the descendants of those first uh, Father Kino peaches. Father Kino was, was largely, uh, you know, he, they determined that he was the one that, that probably introduced these fruit. Um, went to uh, other public sites, tracked down the most historic varieties. Uh, their passage through, um, you know, being there's certain varieties of peaches that are still growing in the desert wild and then up to modern varieties and grafting them all onto one tree. And then um, immediately once I finished this tree, like late on Friday night, I flew here and uh, started a project with the uh, I, I partnered with uh, Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art and the Boulder Apple Tree Project uh, that's on the CU campus to start creating trees ahead of an exhibition at BMOCA in June of 2023. 
Um, so we've planted five apple trees uh, between Longmont and between Boulder. And what I'm doing is grafting historic uh, apple varieties that are, you know, that are, have been discovered throughout Boulder. And a lot of these varieties don't have names. The names fell out. You know, people don't remember the names. Um, but the Boulder Apple Tree Project is going through and doing genetic testing on these varieties to uh, ultimately find out the parentage of the variety, find out their name, and um, help people identify what they do. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And just, I don't know, really interesting to hear just the relationship between science and art. Um, yeah, anybody that has comments? Okay, yeah, I see there's something up in the video. Yeah, drop any comments or questions in the chat bar to the right. Um, but until then, I'll get us started. Um, I just, I had a question. Um, so I'm interested in the relationship between your work and people in the public realm, specifically with the first work you showed with the vent and the security footage and then the rumor started around the holes in the cloud. Um, like there's definitely a seriousness in your work when it comes to the climate, but I also hear some humor in there. So I was just wondering if you could talk about how humor functions in your work. Yeah, I don't, I think, I, I mean, when, I think earlier on, I would really like push the humor button. <laughs> like that was like a way, because I found it as a, a way that people can access your work. And I, I think it was also that I was trying to deal with, with ideas, theories, philosophies that I, they were just like at the edge of my grasp. And I felt that just through humor, it became a way to make that accessible. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And plus, like, I've always been a fan of like, you know, I, I think if you can take a complex thought and explain it to like an eight year old, that's a, that, that's how, you know, you have a grasp on it. Right. And then if you can make it funny, even better. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, we do have a comment that says it is super admirable how much research you put into your work. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your research methods and just um, reaching out to people, like how you sort of prioritize what to do first, when, how? <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily have a research strategy so much as a research obsession. Like it just like, I mean, you get like, you know, you're onto something and it's like, okay, I need to find out everything about this. And with something like the, yeah, this, you know, the orchard project that really spun out of control. Like it was, you know, the first draft of the book that I'm doing for it was a thousand pages. And I'm like, this is the war and peace of fruit. Right. And I don't know. I, I think that it depends on what the project calls for. Like a lot of projects I do like heavy research, some don't require it. So yeah, I, I think it really depends on what, what you're dealing with. Like the, the thing that I think, you know, I want to make myself, so dealing with, with something like fruit varieties, right? So you're dealing with something that it's a product of, of colonialism, right? And so you're talking about how, you know, indigenous lands were taken over. You're talking about how, um, you know, talking about how our tastes have been defined by colonialism, right? Like what we eat, what we're used to eating. And so it's, I want to make myself educated enough and aware enough so that I'm not making mistakes when I'm dealing with the public. And that, that for me is like the big concern. Cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. I have two questions here related to the speakers. <laughs> um, uh, Natalie said, how do you acquire all those speakers? And then Cody says, as a collector of things myself, how uh, were you able to obtain so many objects like the speakers? <laughs> Yeah, um, goodwill. Like, I really like, I think I hit every goodwill from probably like Virginia to Maine. Like, just like, I, and it was, that was just, it, 
it was nuts. Yeah, like I looked at it and I'm like, this is crazy. Um, yeah, and like just going off leads and like, I don't know, like people would call me and be like, hey, I have speakers in my garage. You want them? Uh, I'd be like right over to pick them up. And it, it's surprisingly, it didn't take that long. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Dennis says, in, in relationship to your artwork, how do you define what is natural? Yeah, that's a good question, right? I mean, that, um, yeah, I, I don't, that isn't something that I have a clear definition for, you know, and I, I like that, right? Like holding that concept and ambiguity actually, I think, can make you more aware, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, because what are are we what are we talking about with natural, right? Are we talking? Is it natural that we've like, you know, the way that we're producing food right now? Oh, is it natural the way we're living? Because it's like, I realize I'm on a, a essentially a Zoom call, but it doesn't feel natural. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, no, it's all yeah, it's all artificial. So yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a fascinating take, I feel like. Uh, I don't know, it brings me to my next question, I guess, that um, thinking about your trees, um, you know, what kind of care do your trees take? I was wondering, like, um, does stone fruit generally need this, like, similar care? Or because, you know, usually one plant takes, you know, a certain kind of, you know, however many sunlight or amount of water or certain types of soil or you know so on it's um yeah how do you go about like that aspect (laughs) yeah they took it took a really long time to kind of like get that worked out right so there's you know i definitely whenever possible try to like replace the soil where the trees go um make you know and Like I'm all about organic growing. So I use, um, you know, fertilizers, organic fertilizers that have trace elements, big fan of mycorrhizal fungi, uh, and then do, uh, yeah, do organic treatments on them. And yeah, they, each variety, they they don't really need their own individual um, sort of care. You know, there's, it's sort of just sort of like one care, but it did, it took a really long time and it's, and I was very fortunate in that as I was starting this project and as I've continued to work on it, I've run into a lot of old people who were old farmers or fruit growers who are really generous with their time. Like I show up and I'm like, Hey, tell me about fruit and grafting. And they're like, I've been waiting for you my whole life, you know, and like my kids don't want to have anything to do with it. And I'm like, tell me more, <laughs> you know? Nice. Yeah. Well, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I figured maybe I'd wrap one up with just, uh, what's your favorite fruit? <laughs> oh, it depends on the day. Um, there's, um, I definitely have like favorites of, of each particular variety, but it, I have to say there's a variety. Um, so there's a particular type of plum known as gauge plums, which um, they're like a fresh eating variety. Okay. Their other name is the Rhine clawed plums and they, they originate in France and supposedly like according to connoisseurs, they're considered the best of all fruit. Right. And you bite into them and like it, it very much is like a wine. Oh, wow. and and you're like i have never had this right I, and i mean that's the shocking thing right of like you know why have i never had this before and i'm stuck with like watered down fruit at a supermarket so mm-hmm. that was i always end these things on a low note you know <laughs> like i've got to like, back up <laughs> i don't know we've got one more question here i think we have time yeah. can we save the banana um, I think, yeah, they're, they're um, actually, yeah, it's been like this worldwide hunt to like track down um, a replacement. But at the same time, um, the banana that we know is not the best tasting variety, right? We've just be, you know, it just so happens that it ships really well. 
and uh, it keeps really well. And um, yeah, so but they think they've they've saved it. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Very interesting. Thank you so much. This was yeah really Absolutely. fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Um, you know really appreciate all the hospitality and generosity. Thank you. All right.